Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is the Ukraine War News update, first part thereof, for the 10th of the 10th, 2024. Thank you for spending the time with me. Sorry it's a bit late today. I struggled, uh, I'm struggling today. I've got so much content as well to uh, to vomit out to the world from my... Uh, bedraggled brain that's not even the right word you know what i'm trying to say anyway uh, i have done a, a youtube short this morning i say i oh, thank you to benny pie who has done that uh, a total legend but yeah just playing around with the idea of doing some shorts uh right okay so here we have the ukrainian general staff figures for the russian losses for the day before all the usual caveats apply you can find them in the description to the video below uh kind of mixed bag of nuts 1080 is an immense number of people to lose in a day of course but at the same time that is the slightly lower end of the very high end uh, range so just over a thousand we were seeing closer to 1300 and even above for at some points over the last week or so one tank is obviously a very low number there 14 troop carrying afvs is lower than the daily average 41 artillery systems is over double the daily average so that's pretty good two multiple launch rocket systems is good and three anti-aircraft warfare systems very good there obviously it depends what they are 74 vehicles and fuel tanks is a high number in that category and probably indicates the use of a wider range of vehicles to do attacking and also could be that logistics are being hit like suvs bukanka scooby-doo vans all, all that kind of stuff and one piece of special equipment is low in that number so a bit of a mixed bag of there interesting that the pentagon is coming out and saying that russian losses in the war uh top 600 000. so they ap appear to be in broad agreement with the ukrainian general staff figures russian losses again both killed and wounded in action in just uh the first year of the war exceeded the total of all soviet losses in any conflict since world war ii combined uh the official said so my goodness the pentagon um, agreeing that the Russians have lost phenomenal numbers of troops. But yeah, uh, that is lower than what the Ukrainians claim. They say over 600,000, so top 600,000. Ukrainians saying 665,000. Essentially, if you believe the Pentagon but not the general staff, then it means the general staff are over-exaggerating by 10% or they're inaccurate by 10% or whatever. And actually, that's doesn't really change a lot if we had here 600,000 not 665,000 you guys would have been like yeah that would have really changed our idea of what's going on in a war and when you have 1,100 people lost in a day change that to a thousand it doesn't really affect the conclusions we are deriving so it's really fascinating the pentagon have said that um, I, I always make the point, though, that any intelligence service that is looking at losses is going to be massively dependent on what the general staff say anyway. The Pentagon don't have people on the ground with clipboards going around looking at how many dead bodies there are. So what the general staff do is they get all the units, supply them with video evidence, and it is quite a high you know, threshold of of evidence that has to be provided as in this isn't a case of units pulling numbers out of their posterior they present these videos uh, and evidence and that evidence is compiled and they they get a number derived from that the us are going to be looking at that data and trying to work out whether that data is reliable or not they're not going to be going and getting the source data themselves the Pentagon's not going to be doing that. They don't have the ability to do that. They can look at satellite images and they can have their own teams looking at what social media is just like we see from Andrew Perpetua, those kind of lists and Oryx. Pentagon doesn't have a magic uh, ability to know anything more really than what we know through the socials and what the general staff knows through their own calculations there isn't like a, a third way of getting this information okay so bear that in mind whenever we hear what the pentagon say what uk intelligence say what the estonian intelligence officials say they are going to be looking at all the same kind of data and going yeah they in this case yeah it looks like the ukrainians are the general staff are pretty accurate here right 
there was this claim yesterday that came out, which is, and I don't know how reliable this is at all, but you've got John Sweeney. I've interviewed John Sweeney. He had a lovely chat together. He is quite morose here, and he's talking about speaking to a journalist who says that there have been 100,000 deserters. Now, is that over the whole course of the war? Is that just in the last few months? Is that true at all? Is this somehow Russian information that has crept into the discourse in Ukraine? So that is out there. I don't think that's going to be the case. That would just be absolutely... Uh, well, I'm sure yeah, that, that you would have seen the effect of that massively. Um, is there a problem with deserters? Probably. It's a war. You're almost certainly going to get deserters on both sides. Um, but just thought I'd I'd share that with you. Um, Russian Air Force have lost uh, a Yak-130. That's a training aircraft. It has been lost in the Volgograd region uh, while doing training. Crew left the plane safely. Apparently, uh, they are in hospital. Preliminary cause is aircraft, aircraft failure. It's not a fighter. This is from Fighter Bomber, the Telegram uh, channel. Quite reliable Russian actual pilot, as far as I understand. But anyway, uh, this is not going to affect frontline activities in any way but it does affect the russian ability to train their pilots uh, it's more of a long-term issue for the russians there um there are losses confirmed sorry this should have been before in the personnel bit uh losses have been confirmed by the freedom fighters liberty of russia legion uh, so there's a few of these there's a russian um, volunteer corps and there's a liberty of russia legion and there's also, is it the Siberia Legion as well? Anyway, losses are confirmed by these guys is in a bit of a sort of cryptic statement from them. In connection with numerous injuries and publications about losses in the Legion, we inform you. So obviously some people have been making claims on the socials. Currently, units of the Legion Liberty of Russia are performing combat opera, um, tasks in Kharkiv region. So they are fighting up maybe Vovchansk sort of area, uh, Lipsy area. Unfortunately, there are losses among the Legion, including irrecoverable losses. In other words, we have lost some people and equipment, possibly, uh, and we ain't getting them back. Pr premature dissemination of information about the progress and details of the fighting poses a threat to those who are still in combat. Safety of the Legionnaires is a priority for us. We ask that you respect the warriors who do not and do not disseminate information about the situation until the fighting is over. At the end of the active phase of combat operations, we will report the results of the combat tasks. So I don't know if that is reflecting bad losses for them or that's just like people are claiming X, Y, Z. Don't do that yet. We have had losses, but, you know, wait till the end of the operation and we'll let you know how we got on type thing. Right. OK, I should have showed you this. Yes, sir. I showed you the loss on Andrew Perpetua's loss list, which was it. In fact, we we Googled the 39 N6 Caster 2E2 radar. This is it being taken out by the HIMARS. And yeah, that's uh, probably uh, in a bit of a spot of bother there. So that's that radar being taken out. On the other hand, here we have and I haven't seen this discussed anywhere else. Only war vehicle tracker. Uh, but a strike on the Ukrainian SAM site. Now, he initially says, and I'm unsure what the conclusion right now is, he says presumably a Pac-3 or a Pac-2 Patriot, which would be insanely bad news for the Ukrainians. Russians correctly targeted the ANMPQ-5356 radar along with the ANMSQ-104 ESC engagement control station. In other words, they didn't go for the launches, they went for the radar and command centre, which is, as he says here, the correct decision. Instead of going for the two spread out M901 or M903 transporter to launches. So, yeah, you, this is not good news for the... Uh, Ukrainians but the question is exactly what was hit uh, and he's unsure so he goes on to say uh, and asking John Ridge from Tuchny any idea what happened here one tell seems to launch two at once uh, one of them went rogue and in a different direction uh, that's to do with the launching the launch is actually working consider that I am with the ID going with the Russian claims for now it is most definitely an active real SAM site but I'm starting to have some doubts regarding the ID, as in of it being a Patriot. They most definitely seem to hit the most important parts of it. But what exactly, I can't tell so far. Closer look at the targets and then, you know, has a look. It's very difficult with the quality of resolution that there is, or indeed isn't. Um, yeah. 
the Russians are claiming Patriot seems like the correct coordinates. Uh, they also targeted the tail, uh, likely destroying it, judging by the close in close impact. So it could have lost a launcher as well. Didn't hit it directly, uh, but could have could have um, done some some damage. Um, okay, so it's uh, ninety one kilometers from the nearest front line. So Orlan can and did reach it. First missile was an Airburst Iskander. Second, because of the cut, I don't know myself. Um, area between Dnipro and Zaporizhia is what someone is saying there. He goes on to say, according to Donbass Partisan, a Russian channel that also previously reported about this strike, a similar strike was carried out against the target in Mykolaiv. It is currently unknown what the target was and if we will see a video. So there are also claims of potentially a similar target, so a surface-to-air missile system being targeted in the Mikhailov region. This is why it's so important that those Orlans and Zalas and Supercam medium-range reconnaissance drones are taken out. They are without those, you don't have a target to strike at. You don't know where you're you're shooting. So th you can't do strikes like this without those medium range drones, and that's why the Ukrainians are trying so hard to take them out of the sky with their FPV drones and other means as well. So you know, I would suggest that striking these reconnaissance drones with expensive missiles is also justified i've said that throughout the war it's not you don't look at the value of the drone you look at the value of what it can do or the opportunity cost of not taking it out of the sky so using a hundred thousand dollar missile a short range missile against a, a ten thousand dollar drone is good return on investment because if that drone spots for a 200 million dollar piece of kit you have saved an awful lot of money and capability loss as well. So that's potentially some bad, bad news there. But we'll see as to what the ID is as more and more people get to look at that. A video of a Russian FPV uh, drone compilation. He said, uh, Rob Lee says, pre presumably a vandal. So I, I often show you a lot of Ukrainian uh, successes you are perfectly welcome to look at R Russian successes against Ukrainian equipment. Here we have Kirpi, the um, armoured vehicle. Uh, it, actually, a Ukrainian armoured vehicle pulling a Kirpi, but that's the Kirpi is an MRAP provided by the Turkish, a destroyed striker, and a compilation of Ukrainian equipment losses. Most were previously recorded from September. Uh, striker, Marda, Kozak, Kirpi, Max Pro, M113, Bradley, etc. So lots of equipment being taken out uh, by the uh, by the Russians as well don't think that the Ukrainians aren't having a hard time of it and of course they are but the question is what is the ratio of destroyed equipment of Ukrainian to Russian so I I don't usually just show you stuff getting destroyed or even referenced it unless it tells us something unless it's so super important like this for example potential Patriot strikes um, but that there, there are there is obviously evidence of both sides losing lots of equipment we just have far more evidence of the of the Ukrainians taking out more Russian equipment than vice versa. Okay, this is an interesting one because you've got a drone dropping uh, a munition on a what appears to be a sort of warehouse of equipment, Russian equipment, and my goodness, it blows up. And that's why you know there's some uh, munitions stored in there. It absolutely blows up and almost takes out the drone. Worth looking at that one as we see the Russians having struggles with um, their depots getting taken out. This is one obviously much closer to the front line and that's being taken out by drones. Of course, that would be something that both sides work hard to do. Uh, just to remind you of uh, the problems in Kherson where the Russian, uh, and I spoke to Brendan Kelly about this didn't I twice so where the Russians are trying to on purpose take out civilians with their drones Euromide Impress is reporting this a good practice for drone operators um, as I showed you yesterday it was oh there was a um, yeah it, it was just to I, I didn't spend a long time 
on this statement yesterday. Uh, and I just wanted to return to it because what they're doing is terrible. And, and we've seen so much evidence of this now. And uh, as, as mentioned, I've spoken to Brendan about that several times. But we've been wondering exactly why they're doing it. And the idea that one of the Russian Z bloggers has described the ongoing human safari in terms of a good practice for young drone operators. We said the reasons were that they are doing this. The reasons could be that it is practice for their drone operators to strike at moving targets like cars in Kherson to give them the practice of striking at moving targets on the front line. So they do their practice in Kherson and then go somewhere else to get um, to to do it for real, if you like. So she, these civilians are, are used as practice targets. Also, there's the idea that it's just pure psychopathy and they actually get a kick out of this. And also it's working for reasons of terrorism, for trying to break the spirit of the civilians in the area. If we can't have Kherson, then you can't have it either. And we'll break the spirit if we do ever come to take the area back. You'll have all deserted anyway. And of course, all those three are not, they're not mutually exclusive. They can work together. And we kind of concluded that that's probably the case, that all of those, all of those reasons are working for the Russians in that area. But here is the admission that it is practice for their drone operators. And that's just hideous. Okay, uh, a another Russia hashtag Russia on fire earlier today a market in Nogilsk burned down 50 kilometers east of central Moscow actually turned into a really big looking fire there a uh, powerful fire in the Moscow region 3,000 square meters covered by fire central market in Noginsk uh, near Moscow is burnt into flames its entire territory is on fire according to preliminary data no one's injured but it is you know that is a big fire and when you're having this, as I keep saying, day after day after day across Russia, you know, it is going to take its toll, but it's also reflective of something, isn't it? OK, moving on to the distant strikes. We have Ukrainian Air Force reporting on a fairly widespread missile and drone attack. In fact, I say fairly, I mean, very Although it's funny, I say very when I look at this and see six. Uh, what's that? Five six seven eight missiles and say oh that's that's a quite a wide scale strike but of course it's not it, it is in terms of the drones 62 drones sent in but we look at the dell stats and and look at the the peaks and troughs of cruise missile uh, or missile strikes into ukraine actually um we we we've had quite a big no that's artillery we're cruise missiles there we we have had quite a big gap where really not a lot has been taking place if you go back to earlier in the war here you had every so every week or two you had substantial missile barrages of over 60 missiles or up to 60 between 40 and 60 missiles then there was a big gap and we were talking about stockpiling and then they did have a, a little bit. But again, looking like they, they had trouble building missiles. And then you had a massive gap and then there were some large scale missile uh, barrages. But that took them stockpiling. And then we've had a bit of up and down, a big gap and then a big barrage. But after that big barrage, back down to virtually nothing. I mean, all the way down here you are getting like two or three missiles sent a night. Point being that the Russians are definitely struggling, struggling to make their missiles at the rates they need to, to achieve the kind of fire rates that they got earlier on in the war. And remember, this, this period here, the statistics weren't being um, compiled effectively. So there were, there were days when there were hundreds, I think, you know, at the early stage of the war, there were absolutely huge waves of missiles first few days huge ways but that's not it's not reflected by the stats so you probably got that going all the way back to there is my guess pure speculation maybe even higher higher numbers right up here you may have even had record numbers on the opening days of the war as they were just sending all sorts of missiles all over the shop uh but basically from from here on in i i think you are seeing evidence that the russians are really struggling 
to manufacture and, and procure those uh, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. So anyway, it's a bad night when we when we see eight missiles get through. None of these were shot down, unfortunately. So two is kind of M ballistic missiles, one KH-31P anti-radar missile, two KH-59-69 cruise missiles, and three S-300 surface to air missiles used in their ground attack mode ballistically, ballistic missiles there. So all eight missiles got through. 62 Shahid drones uh, uh, were sent in, 41 were intercepted and 14 were taken down by electronic warfare, which gives you 55, which means that seven drones got through. So seven drones and eight missiles is going to... Remember, even though this is you know, not extensive damage on a, on any given night by the Russians. You add this, you multiply that by seven and then multiply that by four and you've got a lot of damage getting done per month to the Ukrainian energy infrastructure, port infrastructure, civilian infrastructure, damaging their, their spirit. Uh, and this grinds the Rus the Ukrainians down. Now, um, here is an example of a Russian kamikaze drone going into a residential building in Kriviria yesterday. And now that then goes into what looks like a terminal phase. I don't know, though. So someone else with more expertise can let me know. Like the engine seems to cut out. So is that electronic warfare having an effect and it going into a civilian building because electronic warfare has taken it out, has stopped it working? Or is that what happens on its terminal phase? And it, th this is it's found its target and it's diving and it's actually aiming for that residential building. I don't know. And then it goes down and explodes. Uh, let me know, guys. Someone, some of you will have more knowledge on that than I do. Right, Russian attacks across Ukraine killed at least eight people and injured 34 over the past day. So one day, eight people died, 34 injured. Uh, again, multiply that by seven, multiply that by four, and you've got a pretty horrible month. Right, this consistent grinding of the Ukrainians is going to be... Awful. It is awful for them, but it's psychologically awful for them as well. Right, there is a report that Russia is reportedly redeploying Kinzhal missile carriers to Belarus for the first time in over a year. And here's a bit of an issue. In the same way I've suggested one of the things that Ukraine can do is to have their F-16s uh, positioned in air, air bases in, say, Romania. And then when they go on a, a mission, they hop over to Ukraine, refill and then go and do their thing and then refill very quickly and get back to Romania. You're keeping those planes safe in Romania or wherever so that Russia can't hit them. Russia are doing this with Belarus. So what does this say about the Ukrainian ability to strike air bases in Belarus? Because basically Russia is now ring fencing these Kinzhal carriers so that they can use them from Belarus inside Belarus with impunity and there's nothing Ukraine can do the only thing Ukraine can do is strike those airplanes well in the air or in the air bases inside Belarus Belarus is complicit in this war anyway uh, Odessa was hit yesterday evening. Five more deaths, says Tim White. Eleven injuries. Ballistic missile attack on Belarus. Port infrastructure for the third time in four days. A foreign ship was attacked. This one carrying the flag of Panama. The blast was heard even in the shelters. Uh, it is, yeah, an ongoing issue for Odessa. So during the attack, a civilian ship under the flag of Panama... Container ship Shui Spirit was damaged. This is a third foreign ship attacked by Russia in the last four days. Just terrible. Odessa is really coming under a lot of pressure. It's because that is the conduit for Ukrainian exports and their way of getting money in so that they can prosecute the war, the defensive war against Russia. In the same way that Ukraine is trying to hit the Russian oil infrastructure and sanctions are trying to hit them economically, uh, so on and so forth. 
the Russians are trying to do the same to Ukraine in terms of hammering at their uh, at their export industry. Russia struck Russia struck elderly care center at night, injuring nurses, according to Euromaidan Press. The Kherson, again in Kherson, who knew? Regional prosecutor's office reported that Russian forces targeted a geriatric center in Kherson Oblast last night, injuring two civilians. The law enforcers have launched a pre-trial investigation under the supervision of the Kherson District Prosecutor's Office for violating the laws and customs of war. Uh, according to the investigators, at around 2am on October the 9th, Russian forces shelled Stepanivka in a Kherson district, hitting the geriatric centre. Two medical workers sustained injuries during the attack. Prosecutors, alongside law enforcement, are taking all necessary measures to document these war crimes committed by Russian forces, against, uh, according to the report. Uh, Russia attacks civilians on a daily basis in the frontline regions using artillery, gliding bombs and missiles. Additionally, Russians target residential areas and civilian infrastructure in rear regions regions including uh, using drones and missiles i was having a, a I, I put a real rant on my facebook the other day uh, about the execution of pow's and one of my friends who used to play rugby with him he's uh, he's quite conservative so we have had very very many very public arguments on facebook about politics right over the years but he he came at it uh, this is terrible but my goodness, I see so many Russians dying as well. And he came, it was complete both sidesism. And I had to point out, yeah, it's, it's not both sidesism. Like the Ukrainians have not committed 150,000, there have not been 150,000 logged war crimes that the Ukrainians have done. Don't give me this false equivalence BS. It's, it, the Ukrainians are not targeting geriatric centers. We're just going to see what the Ukrainians have done with their airstrikes. We've seen that a building in Krivirya has been blown up. We've seen that a geriatric centre has been targeted. We've seen Kherson civilians being used as drone operator um, training operations. It's just, yeah, I, I, you know, I can barely find the words. It just makes me insanely angry that a British guy that should have the same access to information that I do uh, but clearly lives in a different world, concludes that, oh, war is terrible, but it's kind of like both sides' fault. Just does my nothing. Does my nothing, that one. Now let's look at what the Ukrainians have done with their uh, targeted, uh, or targeting, uh, and their targeted strikes in at, in this case, well, the first one we're going to look at is Yeysk in Krasnodar, where they have hit another weapons and ammo depot. I almost did a uh, breaking news on this last night. So there's supposed to be hundreds of hundreds of Shahid drones stored there. Some saying 400 drones were stored at this place. No, and this is the point. So why I've got Tim White's version of this is because I wanted to make this point with regard to what I was just saying. Notice how there are no civilian injuries from Ukraine's strike, whereas Russia strikes civilian targets in Odessa and elsewhere. Absolutely. What you have here is a military target being taken out. Just, yeah. And some serious explosions coming from this, as we've seen with other ammunition depots being hit. Yes, Ukrainian forces hit the Shahid drone warehouse, according to PS01. According to some reports, 400 Shahids were stored there. Russians claim those are gas cylinders that are exploding. Uh, lots of footage there of these gas cylinders exploding um total area 800 square meters says ps01 lots of secondary detonations going off there uh, early this evening ukrainian navy r360 neptune cruise missiles slammed into russian storage facility outside of yes so the claim is that these are missiles neptunes being used we hear occasionally like oh that was a neptune uh, we don't hear too much more about it neptunes could well be uh, a, a really useful part of the Ukrainian armory because I, I, I don't know whether they are more resilient to electronic warfare interference, whether they are, they're obviously going to have a greater warhead, I would have thought, than the drones, um, necessarily, but I think, I think they probably do, and they're going to be much quicker and more difficult to shoot down than the drones. Uh, and here we see possibly a, a huge successful them in, in striking another 
uh, ammunition storage facility. Um, yeah, secondary explosions continue to go off there, and that's where it's situated in the Krasnodar Oblast there, um, not too far from Ukraine, just over the Azov Sea. A massive explosions in lots of different videos. Then we also have this. So last night, the Mykop airfield in the Russian Adyar was attacked by drones and it continues to burn. NASA firms data has registered a fire by the runway fuel tanks for the aircraft were apparently hit as well as, um, well, he says fuel tanks or aircraft for aircraft or a warehouse for aerial bombs could have been there many people are saying it's fuel and lubricants that have been hit there the airfield is used by the russian bomber aviation um what other uh details of this do we have there is imagery of as you can see there quite black um clouds which means it's probably hit oil depot the oil storage there fuel storage uh, last night, a military airfield in Adyar, southern Russia, came under l attack by strike drones, resulting in explosions and fire, as per local officials and eyewitness reports. The Khanskaya airfield, located approximately 400 kilometers from the front lines in Ukraine, was targeted in the assault. Um, NASA firm's map shows a fire at the airbase near the runway, suggesting the attack targeted fuel and ammunition facilities like previous attacks on Russian uh, airfields in the morning the head of Adyar Murat Kampilov confirmed the drone attack and announced the evacuation of residents from the nearby village of Rodnikovi due to the fire in the airfield area so that would suggest maybe that there is ammunition that could fire off into nearby houses as opposed to if it's just the fuel that that's going to catch fire there then that won't particularly spread further than the um the local that immediate area drones targeted the russian airbase 400 kilometers behind lines explosion and fires were reported at the airbase authorities evacuated locals from a nearby village so there you go another successful attack again hitting explicitly military targets there and just to let you know that theodosia is still burning that's the oil depot on the southeastern coast of crimea is still i think this is the third day uh, after three nights of, of burning, it is still burning there. Okay, moving on to other bits and pieces. Right, Tim White says, before I end, this is his yesterday thread, I can post some light at the end of the tunnel concerning the darkness known as Russia. A new poll from the reliable Levada Center shows a rise in anti-war sentiment. With too many scared to tell the truth, the real figures may well be higher. Um, the percentage of Russians who believe the war in Ukraine has been bad for Russia is up to 47%, where only 28% it's, say it's good, 10% lower than May and last year. The number who think it's been unsuccessful for Russia, the Russian army is up to 23%, the highest total for 14 months. So there is some shift in the right direction. So uh, do you think that the special military operation in the Ukraine has brought more benefit or more harm? More benefit has gone from 38% in May 23 to 28% now. 10% lost there. And that's gained in people who think it's caused more harm. Um, that's gone up 6% and then 4% finding it difficult to answer, which is a bit of a cop-out. Uh, and then the other one is, the uh, sorry, that's the Russian uh, iteration, which is yeah being reported by a number of people then Ilya Ponomarenko talks of another poll so a fresh Ukrainian poll is out saying 81 percent of Ukrainians staying in the country believe Ukraine can inflict Russia on Russia's serious defeats and precipitate a positive outcome of the war if provided with appropriate support by the West so 81 percent of people are say, saying yep yeah, we can we can give Russia such a bloody nose we just need the right support 14, I know I, I would be one of those for sure. 14% said that Russia is way too strong and that Ukraine would not have any success in war, even with appropriate Western support. They're probably going to be your pro-Russian contingent. Uh, last year in December 2023, 87% had positive expectations and only 7% were pessimistic about that. So actually, there is a bit of a shift. 
um, in, a, in a negative direction, but it's still pretty good. Uh, public morale remains quite okay, says Ponomarenko, in Ukraine, despite emotions running high on social media. And that's an important corrective there. Now, fascinating claim here. Head of GUR, Kirill Budanov. So, you know, the straight-faced Budanov, so many memes about him. We often refer to him. He apparently... So he has a history with special forces himself. So he, he used to be special forces. And there are pictures of him as, you know, in his uh, wetsuits and, and whatnot involved in activity, I think, from 2014 onwards on Crimea, possibly. But anyway, uh, Budanov personally took part in the operation in Vovchansk that led to the liberation of the aggregates plant, according to the intel officer Linux. Krilo Ox uh, Alexeyevich uh, was with us at the key stage for several days, directly overseeing the mission. It motivates the fighters, he said. Uh, and that, that it just blows my mind that 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 be the case. Uh, there was another report on that. No, um, I did have a, another source on that as well, but I, I've I've lost it. But yeah, it, really interesting that Budinov was claimed to have been um, uh, active there. I think one of the mainstream media outlets was was reporting on that. Um, Ukraine has seized a ship carrying a, Cam a Cameroonian flag. The dry cargo ship USKO MFU has been confiscated for illegally entering ports in occupied Crimea in July. The vessel was detained by marine security in Odessa region. The captains accused of damaging Ukrainian state interests. So it could be that this ship took grain from Crimea, then went out, delivered it. It's come back to Odessa area and has been... Uh, taken in by the Ukrainians. I don't know the rules about this. I don't know the ramifications of this. I'm just reporting that to you. Interesting outcome uh, there. Uh, interesting event there. So uh, we'll see if that that. Um, I don't know wh whether you could deter cargo ships from taking grain from Crimea and, and places and delivering it to Syria or elsewhere. Would this act as a deterrent? I don't know. Right, Chris Owicki says, the Russian government's sudden ban. So I should have reported this yesterday, but I haven't done my geopolitics video yet. Basically, Russia banned Discord. So you guys go and join our Discord server. I don't hang around there much at all because I just don't have enough time in the day. But there's plenty of you guys there being cool. So go and join the ATP Geopolitics Discord server. It is li linked in the description below. But Russian, the Russian government has banned Discord all of a sudden. But it's being criticised as disastrous by Russian mill bloggers due to its impact on the Russian military's battlefield command and control. Quote, everyone is back to the level of March 2022, one says. Videos published by Russian military units such as the one above show them using the Discord instant messaging and voice over internet protocol platform to uh, coordinate drone and artillery strikes. The abrupt decision by Russian regulator Roskomnadzor to ban Discord has blocked this for many units. Milbogger Troika complains about the impact, quote, at the control centers of dozens of compounds broadcast from drones operating through closed Discord rooms have dropped, thus setting everyone back to the level of March 2022. Even the Ukrainians in America couldn't do that. Uh, Zhivov Z says sarcastically that Ukraine should award Roskomnadzor with a second star of here of the hero of Ukraine. The first one was already awarded from Kiev for de-anonymizing de 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 Russian bloggers. In other words, they're not anonymous anymore. Uh, words with such friends, we do not need enemies. Ouch! Soldier Fortune asks, "What's your beef with Discord? What did they do? Do you know that the army actively uses Discord? Let's all effing block it." Like lately, I've been more peed off with Roskomnadzor than with the Ministry of Defense. Ouch! <laughs> That's neither uh, good for the Russians. There. Anyway, so on and so forth. There, there's a long old thread of Russians complaining that Discord has been shut down. Uh, Jane Kiev talks about there's more Russian military channels complaining that the operations in Ukraine are interrupted because of Discord being blocked. Russian government blocked the popular platform two days ago. It's hard to believe that the US hasn't forced Discord to cease Russian business, but, you know, there you go. Here's a translation of one. We, the Russian military, are actively pumping out criticism of the Discord blocking. Your department has disrupted the work of providing broadcasts from drone cameras to our command. Absolutely brilliant. Fantastic. Long may that continue. Now, Andrew Perpetua has had a few rants this morning because 
and you may have picked it up yesterday i reported in my frontline update that there are that there are lots of claims of the russians taking huge amounts of land particularly in Siversk area of verknokomianska and also up around bilirivka into serebyanka and beneath the forest there so halfway up the eastern front line right Surat maps is like showing massive gains for the russians in that area Andrew Perpetua saying, guys, yesterday was an extremely foggy day and people who don't follow the war very closely are acting like a few Russians waving flags around on a foggy day mean anything. It gets old that people are this stupid. I think he's mainly aiming that at Julian Rupka, the uh, the build um, journalist who was often, he often dooms. Uh, Andrew Perpetua is sometimes accused of dooming, but he's actually just accurate and, and quite conservative in his claims. And he's saying that this is just not the case. Like, a single flag that can be dropped from a drone or the foggy day, not knowing what's going on. Getting fooled once is okay. Getting fooled literally every single time this crap happens makes you an idiot. Um, so, yeah, it is it, it is not, arguably not as bad as it might be claimed by some people. Um, but there you go. Uh, just thought I'd throw that one in there as well. Thank you for watching. Really appreciate your support. I'm going to be pumping out quite a lot of content today. I have a feeling because I've got lists of, of sources longer than my arm to discuss with you. Anyway, be warned. Uh, take care, guys. Speak soon.